Well, good morning, everybody. I don't know if I'm on or not. Steve, do you mind checking? We're going to start in the red book this morning. We're going to sing a couple songs. Our first song will be When Love Shines In, page number eight. Page number eight, When Love Shines In. I don't know. It looks like maybe try the blue one. Jesus comes with power, glad and when love shines in every light that walk and set in when love shines in love will teach us how to pray, love will drive the gloom away, turn our darkness into day when love shines in. When love shines in, when love shines in, how the heart is tuned to singing when love shines in, when love shines in, when love shines in, joy and peace to others bringing when love shines in. Have unfading splendor when love shines in. We may have unfading splendor when love shines in, and a friendship true and tender when love shines in. When earth's victory shall be won, and our life in heaven begun, there will be when love shines in, when love shines in, when love shines in, how the heart is tuned to singing when love shines in, when love shines in, when love shines in, joy and peace to others bring some prayer, please. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for so many things. You've given us many blessings in our lives. You've given us the beautiful weather here, a beautiful church, a loving people to help us, helps us to worship you. We ask that you will lead us to worship you as we should worship you. And uh, to thank you for all things you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Before we have our guest speaker this morning, let's turn to page 26. Page 26, In the Garden. I come to the garden Not other 
has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him. I'd stay in the garden with him. Though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for our church. We pray for those that aren't with us this morning. We pray for those that are online that aren't doing well, that you be with them, take care of them, and always keep them in their sight. May you bless Monty as he comes to speak this morning. We're very thankful to have him and his family here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, I'd like to introduce our special guest, his name is Mondy Layden. His family's from Redding, California. And this morning I found out he's a former classmate of my father at Marshfield High School. So this is pretty much his home roots in this area and we're welcome to have him. So come on up, Monty. Thank you. Well, hopefully I've grown up a little bit since I was here last. Um, I have many roots in this church. Uh, my earliest memories of church are right here. Uh, my grandfather, Henry Oberst, in the choir right up here. And um, last time I saw Gordon, he told me how my grandfather would come to the communion table and many times he would recite Isaiah 53 from memory. Yeah. And to hear about that and to know the, the spiritual heritage that I have here. Uh, my mom and dad were the first couple that were actually married in this church. And... Um, as the story goes, as they left here, they, got a, uh, they ran a red light and, and got a ticket. So <laughs> evidently they were on a hurry to some place to do something, but I don't know. <laughs> so, so did the rest of the party. So did the rest of the party. They all got tickets too. Uh, you remember that. So, <laughs> and what is your name? I was Louise Lentz and then I'm Louise Milton now. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, okay. great. Well, no, we're friends on Facebook, I think, now. We are, wow. So I've got roots here and stuff, so some of you probably know about more about me than I know about me uh, on some of these things. So I grew up up Coos River, and I'll be sharing part of my story later on. We were part of fellowship here for a while, and then over North Bend for a while, where you Steve and Cran and Ken and Vicki and Pam and Franklin, who were Sunday school teachers of mine and all that kind of stuff. And I just want to encourage every one of you that the seeds that you sow in the lives of other people will bear fruit for generations to come. Uh, I believe my father ended up attending this church because his neighbor, um, Edith Curl, took them to church. We're going back a ways, aren't we? And uh, my father grew up up... I believe it's Lillian Creek or Lillian Slough. I'm not sure what Lillian Slough. In fact, when we, uh, when I was first uh, hatched, uh, we lived up there for a while, and then we moved farther up the river. But uh, your parents had us uh, for dinner when, uh, after church. Yeah. Just a little guy, and my, I've still got in my scrapbook someplace. There's a. A little poem my dad wrote, it was printed in the church bulletin here. It says, Happy ha Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Now we have Monty James aboard and blah, blah, blah. And I still have that bulletin from this church. It's in my scrapbook of goodies. So my, my roots go back deeply and I am blessed and I am encouraged and I have been formed by many of, you know, I remember at hunting out with Steve, and, you know, his, his brother-in-law, Hugh, bringing out. Now that guy could put away a lunch, couldn't he? <laughs> so um, I was asked to also fill in for Sunday school class um, Derek uh, gave me a call a while back and said he was going to be gone and asked that I would um, if I would available to fill in and first of all I want to say I'm honored to be with here, here with you today um, 
He says, oh, by the way, can you cover Sunday school class? So I've got another message that I'm going to share later on, but I just wanted to spend some time coming back to the very, the very basics of basics. And it's been said before that the main thing is that the main thing stay the main thing, right? Another uh, Bible scholar puts it this way. He says, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And when Jesus left, he said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, everything I, to observe everything I've commanded you, which begs the question, what did he command us? What did he teach? Now, growing up in church, um, often the gospel was come to church, come to church, come to church. And when we hear that a lot, you know, come to church, you know, take the plunge, get baptized. And OK, now we got your fire insurance and we are in. But if I read Jesus correctly, if I read the Gospels, he used another word a whole bunch, and it wasn't church. Anyone can beg to differ what it may be? The kingdom. The kingdom. Mm-hmm. And if you read through the Gospels, and I, and I did a, a word search here a few years ago. I haven't done it again lately. But the word kingdom is used over a hundred times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if Jesus gave priority to that, what's that tell us about the priorities we ought to have? It's the kingdom. Now, the kingdom, by the way, is much bigger than a building. It's much bigger than an organization. It's much bigger than um, an assembly on Sunday morning. Because sometimes we get, oh, I call instead of preaching a kingdom gospel, we have what we call churchianity. We preach the gospel of the church. Come to our church rather than come meet my king. And if you wanted to sum up the New Testament in three words, it would be probably this. Jesus is Lord. If you want to sum it up in two words, it would be this, King Jesus. That's it. Everything else flows from there, right? So Jesus himself said that what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else will fall into its rightful place. And so I just want to encourage you this morning to keep that the first of everything. So many times we, oh, I got to get the church. I got to do this. And it's church, church, church. Rather, and, and by the way, you know how many times the word church is used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Twice. And when Jesus talked about church, he wasn't talking about a building or an organization. We had elders and deacons and pews and hymn books and PowerPoints and streaming and all that kind of stuff. And at 11 o'clock Sunday morning or whatever it is. The church was the ecclesia. That's the Greek word, and it means the called out ones. You and I have been called out of darkness into light. We have been called out of the world into the kingdom. We have been called out of a life without hope and without purpose into a life full of hope and purpose. And we've been called into the presence and walking daily with Jesus. And that's a much... I can get on board with that rather than show up and plant your backside in church and stay there and make sure you're, you know, obeying the scout law and doing everything right. Because the kingdom of God and righteousness is about a right relationship with God, not just about doing the right stuff. So let's take a look at some stuff, things here. Um, um, so and I just kind of want to go through some of these real quick here. Um, and I may call on some of you to look up some of these. So this is Bible school class, right? So let's be interactive and let's do some stuff here. So I'm going to um, um, I'm going to start up here. Mr. Brainerd, right? Yes. All right. So I'm going to have you look up. You got your notes here? And by the way, I didn't know if you're having PowerPoint or what was. So I went old school. I just, you know, printed off a bunch of stuff here. So um, if you could look up the first one in Isaiah, chapter 9, 6, and 7. Um, young... Um, uh, I'll have you go next. Can you look at Matthew 3 1? All righty. And uh, I need another volunteer. If not, I'm going to start calling people. In the back over there, I need you to Matthew 4 17. Okay, Matthew 6 9 and 10. Who would like that one? All right, you got Matthew 6 9 and 10. And Matthew 6 33, we've already talked about. Uh, Matthew 10 5 and 8. Uh, you got it there, okay, bud? And um, I'm not going to get into all of Matthew 13. Um, Matthew 24, 14. Someone else want to grab that one for me? Okay, Steve back there. Um, uh, Acts 1, 3. All right, got another one there. 
And um, let's see, let's do Matthew, uh, we're going to just take the last one in Acts here, and that's Acts 28, 23. Okay, I mean, I'm just going to go down through these here in a minute. Okay, you got that one there, bud? And then um, Acts 28, 30, since you're right there, grab that one as well. Okay, and then I'll end the last one here. So, in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to this kingdom. They were looking forward to something even greater than what they had. And uh, someone want to read Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For a child was born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Eternal Father and the Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Yeah. For how long? Forevermore. forevermore. Yeah, and the government will rest on his shoulders. This is not to just be a temporary thing. To it's not a political thing. And by the way, we've been struggling a lot in our country with everybody wants you know, their particular political person to be the savior. I've got a news flash for you. He's not. Okay. No political person can bring about the spiritual end. It takes a spiritual answer to a spiritual problem, right? And our biggest problems in this country are not political, they're spiritual. And we've got to hang on to that. And, and so many times we're looking to a political person to, to be our savior. Do you know that the church thrived under Nero? Politics were not in their favor. The church was strong and they grew, even under persecution. And whether or not we were granted 401c3 uh, um, tax-exempt status and we had the privileges and our quote-unquote freedom to worship, the church was still free because they knew that their king was Jesus. And we have to hang on to that. And so, you know, it's, it's easy to get sucked into all the political discussion today about all that. And I think we are above politics because Jesus is neither a Democrat nor a Republican. He's the ultimate independent. Right? <laughs> and even the Supreme Court will have to answer to a supreme being. Yeah. So um, I'll come back to that later on if we have time. But don't get me on my hobby horse because I'll get rolling, man. <laughs> um, so this kingdom they were looking forward to, and, and an increase of his government, there will be no end. And I'm looking forward to that. Because as we're going to discover later on, the kingdom of God is both present, it is unfolding, and it is fully yet to be revealed. It is past, it is all three. We, it is expanding, it is, it is growing. Okay. Message of John the Baptist was what? Matthew 3, 1. Who had that one? Keep going. Saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Yeah. He said, Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. It is here, God, it is ready. And the fact that the king is there demands a response of repentance. And repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry, it is a it's a 180. It is a shift. It is a change of direction. The, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It means a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction. But the kingdom of God demands a reorientation of our whole worldview. That uh, there is a king in charge and there is something bigger and better yet to come. And we need to be prepared for it. Now, as John the Baptist's mission was to prepare people for, to receive the king because he's coming. What was the message of Jesus? We'll just take this first one. Matthew 4, 17. Who had that one? Okay, go for it, bud. There we go. Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes. And repentance is a good thing. 
And too many times we think repentance, we got some bony fingered evangelist up here shaking his finger at you and slamming the pulpit. And, you know, he's an angry, ticked off, you better get right kind of guy. <laughs> Rather than, hey, I need to change in order to receive this. If I'm going to receive the riches of heaven, I need to open my hands. Repentance is a good thing, but the kingdom here, and that was Jesus' message too. So you got Isaiah, you got John the Baptist, and now you got Jesus all talking about the same thing, right? Okay. Um, what did Jesus tell us to pray for? Matthew 6, 9 and 10. Who's got that one? Okay. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. Your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. How is the will of God done in heaven? It is done freely. It is done openly. It is obedience. It is, he is forever praised. It is, it is a phenomenal place. And he's saying that he's praying that up there would come down here and live right here. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The God, that you, you would be obeyed, that you would be loved, that you would be the king in every part of my life, every situation. God, you would be king of it all. And I think that prayer, and by the way, should we stop praying that prayer? You know, there was even a group before that, that said, okay, we don't need to pray that anymore because now we got the church. Uh, I think we're a bit imperfect, guys. We still need to keep praying that prayer, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And by the way, heaven is not a place for people who don't want to do the will of God, right? And that's why one day C.S. Lewis, I love the way he puts this. He says, one day God will turn to every man and say, okay, thy will be done. You want a life apart from me? You got it. It ain't going to be any fun. I will honor your free will. Thy kingdom come. And the will of God is a good thing. God always does everything in our best interest. Everything for our good. We have a good, good father, as the song says. And he is perfect in every way, and he can be fully trusted. And like the, there's an old saying that says, when you can't see God's hand, you can still trust his heart. Because his heart for you is good. Always has been, always will be. And I ask myself, why would I want to do my own will? Because my will is destined to fail. Anyone with me? Anyone ever screwed up a bit in life? Get in line behind me. I mean, hi, I'm Monty. This is Sinners Anonymous today, okay? Uh, <laughs> so uh, what do you tell us to pray for? The kingdom come. Matthew 6, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You got that right, David, huh? Yeah. Instead, he said, seek it first. Why? Because it is the best. The rule and the reign of Jesus and all that I do because he can be fully trusted. He knows me better than I know myself. He, he's got me figured out from, from in the beginning. I can trust him. I really can. Uh, what message did Jesus tell his disciples to preach? Matthew 10, 5 to 8. Got it? Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. He says, go tell them the kingdom of God is here. And the reason those miracles accompanied him was to prove that their message was true. And it has been proven true, hasn't it? <laughs> but he said, God, it's here. So you got Isaiah, you got John the Baptist, you got Jesus. Now you got the, the apostles, the disciples sent out all preaching the same message. And was their message come to church? No. The church went to them. And so many times the, the message, and I can still hear your dad saying this, Steve, the message was not come ye, but go ye. Right? Remember him saying that? Yeah. What is the message of many, if not most, of Jesus' parables? You can look right there in Matthew 13 and in rapid fire. The kingdom of God is like this. A man who had a field and... He dug it up and found the treasure. He sold everything to go buy that. Or a, a man who found the pearl of great price. Or, 
are, are so many of Jesus' teachings were sent. This is what, it, it's like a yeast in a dough. It is growing and expanding. So Jesus' message again is the kingdom. And he illustrated it from so many different ways that it was worth giving up everything to have. Because if you don't have the kingdom, when all's said and done, what do you got? Nothing. Nothing. But if you have that, you've got everything. Everything and so much more. Uh, Matthew 24, 14. What gospel must be preached before the end will come? Who's got Matthew 24? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. <laughs> yeah. The gospel is being preached in so many ways today. You know, I mean, in churches, on street corners, on the Internet, in workplaces, in Bible studies, every place it is being proclaimed. It says, and it may best be proclaimed to all the nations, all ethnic groups. Jesus says, you know, make disciples of all nations. That means all colors, all shapes, all races, all sizes. <laughs> We're to make disciples of him, him being the king. But it's interesting, it said it should be preached to all nations because when all is said and done, Jesus will gather to himself in, it says in Revelation, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, right? I'm so blessed to be a part of that because so many, it's not about, you know, we, we think that, hey, you know, God bless the USA and we're the, we're, what's the song say? Kings and kingdoms will all fall away, right? But there's something about that name. I love our country, by the way. But my salvation is not in our Constitution. My salvation is right here and here, right? We hang on to that. But that gospel will be preached. And right now, there are people out there that are translating the Bible into all kinds of languages, new ones. A friend of mine from Bible College, uh, Joe, worked for a Bible translator. You know, and they're, they're putting it out there so people can hear so people could know the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, what did Jesus teach about ask after his resurrection? Acts 1 3. Who's got that? Okay. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Yeah. So after the resurrection, Jesus is still talking about what? The kingdom. He showed proofs. He talked to them for 40 days. He said, look, I've, I've given you. I've resurrected from the dead. I've conquered death. I've showed you that I am the real deal. I am legit. I am the resurrection and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. He is just declaring it. But what did he teach them? And why did he teach them about that? Because they still had to live on this earth before their time came to depart. And that's the message for us is we've still got to live in that kingdom every day. King Jesus. Um, uh, what message was preached in the gospel of, of Acts? There was another one there. Uh, we could, you see the, the, the message of the apostles. But in Acts 28, 23, what's going on there? Okay, got it. So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Yeah. So even the book of Acts ends. Acts, Paul is in prison, and he shows up, and what's he tell them? Is he giving them a class on church leadership? He's telling them how to conduct a successful Sunday school campaign, best recipes for church potlucks. <laughs> is he telling them about, you know, this is my, my you know, this is, how you know it's about the kingdom that was his message and he's reasoning from the old testament scriptures about jesus the king even to the very end of his ministry he is still proclaiming that uh, what message ended the book of acts who's got acts 28 30 okay again for the next two years paul lived in rome at his own expense he welcomed all who visited him and he's still there preaching the kingdom from those earlier verses we just saw. How will history end as we know it? Some of my favorite memories of growing up in Coos Bay are 
the Christmas Vespers. I still remember Miss Mack and then later on those who followed her. And they would end uh, on Monday night. Alumni would come down. Steve, I still remember you going down and they would sing the Hallelujah Chorus. And one of the lines in that song, taken straight out of the book of Revelation, the kingdom of our God has become the kingdom of his Christ, of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever. And the whole congregation, the whole audience would be on their feet. I love that song. I can only imagine. I don't know if I'm going to be on my feet or on my face. <laughs> I just know it's going to be a good thing to be faced in the presence of God himself. Awesome, awesome God we have, don't we? So what does the preponderance of this word mean for us? I think it reminds us again that Jesus put the emphasis on the kingdom. And the gospel is the kingdom, not churchianity. Churchianity has come to church... And it's what I call a behavior man. It's sin management. <laughs> not repentance. Not life change or transformation. I can't do these things. I got to check off the right boxes. I got to look just right. I got to do it just right. I got to manage behavior as opposed to, I know I'm here to follow Jesus and love on him and learn more of him. And the kingdom of God, more than just being a place, it's the realm where God is in control. It is God's rule, the future realm of the kingdom. And if you want to be part of the future, you've got to be part of it now. And I remember years ago reading a tract by a guy, and it was entitled, Will You Be Bored in Heaven? And basically the thesis was this. If you don't enjoy loving Jesus and worshiping him and declaring his praises now, when you get to heaven, you're going to be bored. Because there's going to be a whole lot of that going on there, Right? You read the book of Revelation and they sang to him in a loud voice and they, all these people and they're declaring, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory. And remember how Revelation says they looked for someone who was worthy to open the skull and there was no one worthy until the lamb stepped up. He was worthy. He was and is and still is. And the goal of the kingdom is to be ruled by Christ. It is not to rule in this world, but to be ruled by him. Because if he is ruling the heart, everything else will begin to fall in place. Relationships will be different because if Jesus is ruling in that relationship and ruling your tongue and ruling those thoughts and giving you a check to, to, to zip it before you, you blow it, you know, uh, life changes, doesn't it? And how you look at your enemies. Because Jesus said, man, we're going we're gonna to do it right, right? No, he says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And the good news of the gospel is Jesus. And, you know, and it's, we've got to keep that, that first thing, the first thing. And I remember in, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For I deliver to you of first importance. Jesus died. I'll just read it for you. You know, I could sit here and talk about it forever. We're about ready to wrap up here in just a second. First Corinthians 15. I love this passage. First Corinthians 15, 3. I'll start at the verse 1. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and by which you stand and by which you are being saved. I love that the salvation is an ongoing thing. It's past, present, and future. You have been saved, you are being saved, and you shall be saved. It's all three. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and he appeared to more than 500 brothers, most of who are still alive and have fallen asleep. He says of first importance. And it's so important that we as a church keep that first. You know, I imagine if you are like most churches in transition, you had some discussion when the pews went out and the chairs came in, Okay. 
I remember a church that I was serving at once, and the, um, we brought in some different um, instruments. And you'd have thought we denied the deity of Jesus. I read in the Psalms, they had stringed instruments, and they had cymbals, and they had all kinds of things that they had in there. I figured if it's good enough for David, why isn't it good enough for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we get all hung up on all these different things. What, what is the gospel? And Paul says, I become all things to all men that I may, you know, save some. Become like a Jew and I need to become like a Jew, like a Greek. Whatever, I will adapt and I will form, but I will keep the gospel the center. And that gives us great freedom. It gives us great liberty to go into a lot of places and to share in a variety of ways. Because the gospel is not chained to a method. It is chained to a message. There's a big, big difference. So... Are we sharing the good news of the church or the gospel of the kingdom? And I think we've got to ask ourselves that question. Because the gospel of the kingdom goes with you everywhere. Because I'll tell you, you know where the real church is going to take place this week? It's not here this morning. It's tomorrow when you go to work. It's tomorrow when you talk to that neighbor. It's tomorrow when you pick up the phone and you talk to someone else. Or you go to the store and you interact with that clerk who is overwhelmed and needs a smile and needs an encouraging word. That's where the church is going to show up. Because you cannot compartmentalize it to an hour on Sunday morning. It has to be the Monday morning church. Right now, that's, I am not in paid professional ministry. I work a regular job like everyone else. And I have found opportunities to come in under the radar and pray with people and talk with people and out there living it out. Because sometimes when you go in, when you've got a, a minister hat or pastor hat on, whatever, people, then they put up the shield, they put up the defenses, and they think you've got two heads and you're looking funny. But they want to relate to real people just like you and I. Because one of the things that I've learned over the years is this, is that most of us are like the rest of us, right? Well, of failures, we all have regrets, we all have victories, we all have dreams, we all have aspirations. We have things we wish we would have done different. But they want to see God show up in real skin like you and I. And you can show up and you can share your failures. You can share your vulnerabilities. You can share that God is even present in my weaknesses. Isn't that what 2 Corinthians 12 says? For my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. In our humility. So, it's not just facts about Jesus. It's a life with Jesus. And that's what the kingdom is. So, Given that, it looks like our time is up. We're going to get ready for church in a bit, but it's great to see you. Betty, thank you. You didn't go on your trip. You're here. By the way, I'm going to have some friends and neighbors that are supposed to show up today. I just need you guys to be great hosts to them. I invited them here today, so just love on them and let them know how welcome they are here. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are the king. And nothing can unseat you, nothing can unthrone you, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and one day you will ride in on a white horse, and that's what will be written on your side. God, may we worship you and bow before you as King every day today. And when we see you face to face, it'll be like, this is what I was made for. Lord, I pray blessing on each person here today, that as they go through this week, they would walk with you and know your presence. And I would ask this in Jesus' name. Alrighty, we'll see you back at church.